Look, it's snowing. It's, it's really good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, welcome, uh, dear audience, to this Collegium Talks event, uh, which is the first event this spring of the two event series of Colleg Collegium Talks discussions. And, and th these both two events focus on curiosity-driven research, and I will introduce this topic a bit uh, in, a, in a second, but I'll mention that this Collegium Talks is an ongoing series that um, we organize uh, events every term here at Think, uh, Think Corner stage, and we do it, uh, we, we are the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies, which is an independent research institute here at the University of Helsinki, just one block away from here, Fabian and Katu, uh, 24. And just last week, we actually had here a big conference called Moral Machines. Maybe some of you saw that. Um, and uh, these three speakers here on stage today, they are all researchers at the Helsinki Collegium currently working there. Uh, and we have, uh, in general, we have about 40 researchers uh, at the Collegium this year, so it's a lot. Uh, and we wanted to bring some of them here on this <coughs> Think Corner stage to talk about their work. Um, and um, I'll just mention here first their names and then I'll introduce them a bit later. So Jane Cowan is here next to me. She's a Jane and Artas Erko professor um, this year at the Helsinki Collegium. And then we have Michael Langlois and Emilia Mataix Ferrandis, who are both core fellows. Uh, at the Helsinki Collegium. I'll tell more about them soon. But I'll also mention that this Helsinki Collegium is, belongs to this kind of international network of institutes of advanced study. I don't know if uh, you have heard about this kind of um, idea, Institute of Advanced Study, but one uh, fundamental principle of these institutes, which are in different countries in the world, it's uh, precisely this curiosity-driven research that we are going to talk about today. And there are, of course, other names for this. Uh, so curiosity-driven, that you already hear in the name, that it means that the researcher actually is allowed to be led by his or her curiosity, so poses the research questions according to kind of, more kind of maybe internal motivation or kind of uh, the, um, the interest that they, they themselves have and that come in their research process. Um, and sometimes people talk about blue skies research, which kind of refers to this, if you think of blue sky, this kind of freedom and openness, a freedom to carry out research that leads to outcomes that do not, you don't necessarily see um, at the beginning. And then, of course, people talk about basic research and fundamental research. So uh, research that asks fundamental scientific, scientific or scholarly questions and not necessarily, at the beginning, uh, practical applications. So goal is to understand something about the world. Sometimes people also talk about knowledge for its own sake. Um, so today we approach this topic, curiosity-driven research, um, through like um, personal stories of researchers who have embarked on research in humanities and social sciences. And they will tell about how they came to their research topics and how they were led to new research questions through this actual work of doing research and how, what that has actually also meant for their career, what kind of trajectories they have had. Um, and we'll, the structure of the event is such that I'll ask all of them to tell their stories at the beginning and we'll ask some questions. Then we have a more general discussion together and at the end, you will also have the opportunity to pose questions. So if you have questions along the way, then uh, remind, remember them. And at the end, so we will have about one hour for this discussion. And then we have the question and answer session. OK, so, um, so first uh, I'll introduce Jane, Jane Cohen. Uh, so as I said, she works this year at the Collegium uh, as Jane and Artus Erke Professor uh, in Contemporary Studies. And she's also uh, permanently a Professor of Social Anthropology at the University of Sussex in the UK. And uh, Jane will now tell about her path, how she started her research as 
Um, well, she's an anthropologist. She, she was doing field work in uh, northern Greece, and she studied in her dissertation, he studied uh, gender and social dancing in, in Greece. And then currently, if we, if we think about her current project, she's work, working on a book on the history of human and minority rights and the League of Nations, and more specifically on interwar minority petitions concerning the region of Macedonia in, divided between Greece, Yugoslavia and Bulgaria. So Jane will tell about this in more detail. So Jane, how did it, can you explain to us how it came about that you moved from social dancing and maybe a bit more ethnomusicological interest also to this uh, maybe a bit more abstract and uh, more historical work on the concept of minority and also the history of League of Nations? Okay, great. I'm going to do this. Um, and I'm first going to leave you with this image. Um, I think to tell you how I made that transition, I need to tell you about the first yeah. project. So my doctoral work um, was spending, I spent about uh, a year and a half in a small town in the north of Greece. And this was in 1983, and this was after uh, I had already spent a year in 1975 and 76 uh, as an undergraduate student in Greece. And, and it was really that undergraduate year that alerted me to how important um, Greece was as a, uh, a site for social action. And, and so when I came back um, to work in the north of Greece in the small town, I, I was wanting to understand how um, dance was a site where gender was constructed, um, constructed through the body, how gender was performed, um, experienced and embodied. Uh, in the practices of the dance. And I put this picture up because I want to emphasize that it wasn't just about people moving their body and dancing together, but it was also about how they ate and drank and laughed and talked and treated and toasted each other. And all of those practices were, were part of what I was trying to study because I was looking at the dance as an event. Um, and I think the, the question that really motivated me then was a feminist question, let's say the first one, and that was really how are gender inequalities produced and reproduced, not just in sort of situations of work and, and, and violence and you know, stressful, unpleasant things, but also situations of pleasure and conviviality and release and celebration. So, so that's what I wanted to look at, but I also, um, it was really interesting to look at dance in Greece because dance was already um, a, a kind of cultural form that was very highly elaborated, so that um, it, was, it was in fact understood to be something that was an ambiguous site because it was a place where people, you know, enjoyed themselves, they released themselves from all the kind of pressures of daily life, but also they... Um, understood that it was a place where they performed the self, uh, that prestige was at stake, reputation was at stake, things could go wrong, and, and there would be consequences for it. So I suppose those were two of the main reasons that I wanted to, to work uh, on dance in this space. But I also chose to work in this part of, uh, of Greece, in, in Macedonia, precisely because it was a very complex place um, uh, culturally. I'm just going to zip through some of the photos of, of, of the dance work so you can get a kind of sense of, of the place. A rather, you know, had been a kind of wealthy town uh, in the past, but always with um, a very class-differentiated kind of population. And the people there, the, the very wealthy would have been um, Greek-identified vlach um, merchants and um, uh, businessmen, but the, the, the majority of the population would have been um, both Turkish and Bulgarian-speaking peasants. So already it was a polyglot, sort of multiple languages being spoken, 
um, in a place that nonetheless people kind of identified as Greek. So after I had finished um, my research, I'm just going to... This, by the way, is, is a, a photo of the boys getting drunk just before they leave for the army. Um, so, obviously, because of my um, interest in the way that gender is performed, you know, through postures and, and, and gestures, um, I was very interested in the way they got extremely drunk and, and lay on the ground and, and sang songs and cried and expressed a lot of emotions. Okay, but, um, nope. That's the picture I want. Um, when I wasn't hanging around with the young people and, uh, and the women in their houses, I would spend time in this cafe um, as a sort of adopted niece, let's say, to Uncle Thanasi, as we called him. And these men would sing um, Turkish and Bulgarian and Vlach, um, as well as Greek songs. So this really was a kind of uh, experience of understanding how people um, had this very complicated past um, and embraced it and used, in a sense, enjoyed, enjoyed those practices. Um, but they, they didn't, the people here, although they spoke primarily a language that they called Vulgarica, they didn't call it Macedonian, they didn't call it Bulgarian, uh, as, as if it were the formal language, but a kind of dialect of Bulgarian, they didn't identify even so as a minority. They said, we're Greek, we speak these other languages, we have these other kind of traditions and languages. And this was very kind of fascinating to me because in the early 80s, to, particularly in the late 80s, in another part of Greece, uh, another part of Macedonia, um, people around the town of Florina were beginning to emerge uh, and to uh, claim themselves as a Macedonian minority. And whereas the people here on the eastern side of uh, Thessaloniki didn't want to identify as a minority, these other people did. And that's really what raised for me the question, what is a minority? Or more precisely, when? When is a minority? Under what kind of conditions, political conditions, would people want to claim uh, the term minority for themselves or not? Uh, under what conditions would governor, governing bodies, states, or international organi organizations claim that for themselves? So really the question of minority um, emerged uh, as one and that was what led me to the League of Nations, because uh, a historian friend of mine um, told me I might be able to find a record in the League of Nations of people from Sohos who had applied to, under a kind of minority uh, program, to emigrate in the early 1920s under the League of Nations, to emigrate as Bulgarians from Greece uh, and to take on Bulgarian citizenship. Um, and really, that idea of going to the League of Nations had never occurred to me. Uh, but as soon as it was suggested, it made a lot of sense. Um, in fact, my husband was working at the UN at the time. Our two small boys were there. It made a lot of sense for me to check out the League of Nations archives in Geneva. Uh, and through that, I did indeed find, uh, spending two weeks uh, in the archives, I did find a record of 16 applications from this town of people who decided to emigrate because they did not feel Greek. In fact, they felt Bulgarian. So that complicated the kind of picture, the representation of history that people uh, had given me up until that point. Um, so I spent, uh, that was 19... 96, when I had that conversation, I applied for money in 1997. I spent the year 1998 in the archives supported by a MacArthur um, Fellowship. And the project, you know, shifted because it became much more about how, how have Western European 
elites, um, in either in official positions as you know, as states or as members of the secretariat or as um, concerned world citizens, reformists, internationalists, feminists. How were they involved in in? defining and, and regulating difference among the populations in the Southern Balkans. So it became a kind of um, different sort of project um, once, once I, I began sort of spending time in the archives. Um, and if I move to the third project, it's very difficult to kind of say everything in, in, in about 10 minutes, but hopefully we'll come back to some of these things. Um, I mean, having spent a lot of time looking at these archives and looking at the supervision of minority treaties and the important way that bureaucrats um, were, were the ones who were making the initial decisions, um, I decided I wanted to look at how contemporary uh, human rights international supervision was happening. Uh, and because I was commuting for 20 years between Geneva and, and Brighton, it made sense to, again, try to get some research money to be able to not travel every single week and be able to spend time with my family and do fieldwork at the UN. Uh, I then moved to um, looking at the Universal Periodic Review, I've forgotten completely about my slides. This is, uh, this is the sort of Macedonia uh, debate, but, and this is the, the old League of Nations in Geneva. And I'll just, but I, I'll take you very quickly now to the space that I was uh, spending time in in 2010 and, and 11, looking at universal periodic review. Um, and in this case, I actually wanted to um, look at petitions, because my League of Nations work was really a lot about petitions and, and what, what kinds of claims are being made and how are bureaucrats deciding whether those petitions can go forward, uh, and if they do go forward, how are states and how are uh, sort of proto-NGOs dealing with them. So I really wanted to, to be looking at petitions, but what I discovered is that in the contemporary UN, um, petitions, as in their kind of current form, are highly confidential, and so it really wasn't possible. So I then had to shift um, my, let's say, research problem to be much more about looking at the Universal Periodic Review as a kind of audit process, okay, in the context of the auditing that we find in public institutions. Uh, and I talked about this um, review as a kind of public audit ritual. So again, I was having to adapt, um, adapt the research proj project and problem to the conditions that I found. So I think there has to be some kind of, yeah, I mean, some, some ability to adapt to that as well as to follow your, your curiosity. Mm. Anyway, I've taken a very long time, yeah, so but thank you. But thank yeah. you. Thank you, Jane. That was really mm. fascinating uh, trajectory. And I think there were a couple of things that I'd like to raise what, what were really interesting. Um, that it actually, you basically here uh, talked about three different projects, but they all seem to emerge from field work and from mm -hmm. this kind of empirical work that you were doing uh, quite organically. Yeah. And then also, yeah, and then this, um, this kind of complicated existing ideas about certain things that you wanted to uh, work. But then also that your personal life yeah. impacted this trajectory. Absolutely. Or you, you were like, so how would you see that? Like, that it, it actually became very fruitful that your personal life Absolutely. intervened yeah. in a way. Yeah, yeah because I think, uh, you know, had I not had the f uh, my husband not had this job and had we not decided for other kinds of reasons to raise our sons in Geneva, which had to do with issues of childcare and the fact that British childcare is so much worse than what we could get in, in um, or just wasn't available uh, than what we could get in Switzerland, um, meant that 
suddenly the idea of doing a research project in Geneva becomes very attractive. So there's a, mm. there, and, and it's kind of making a, a virtue out of a necessity, mm. I think, you know. And, and, but but had, had the family not been there, probably I wouldn't have opted to, mm. you know, spend yet another year away from my family. So, so it kind of worked yeah. out well, but it was the sort of thing that one could never predict. Yeah, and yeah. if you think about the subject matter, then it also became very fruitful because your earlier work in Northern Greece, of course, Absolutely. eliminates it, the contemporary yeah. analysis yeah, of, yeah, yeah. of the yeah, because human it, rights process. For sure, yeah, because it allowed me to really link um, you know, work, field work in in, a, in small towns and villages, you know, in the northern part of Greece and in, in the rural area. Um, and, and what I was learning there, what I was observing there, and, and using that to kind of think through the documents that I was looking at, mm. okay, they're 80 years old or, 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 or so, but nonetheless, many of the claims that are being made, you know, that these people are, are this or that or the other, would be, you know, very absolutist in the documents. Not all of them, but, but in quite a lot of them. And yet I knew that people could be Macedonian in one context, Greek in another, um, and that they had very sophisticated ways of also identifying other people and knowing other people's histories and situating themselves in relation to them. So to move between those two spaces, I think, was really fascinating, mm. very productive, yeah. Yeah, I think we'll come back to that. Yeah. And now uh, maybe we'll move to Michael. Um, so I'll introduce him briefly. Uh, Michael Langlois uh, is a is core fellow at the Helsinki <laughs> Collegium this year and next year as well. And he's also uh, associate professor at the University of Strasbourg in, in France in the Faculty of Theology. And what he will talk about is that he was first trained in formal sciences, especially mathematics, computer science, physics and chemistry, but then he got interested in the humanities and he studied to, uh, studied to study theology, history and philology. And his current uh, research focuses on the history and development of the alphabet in relation to the composition and transmission of the Bible. So now we'll hear Michael talk so can you tell us uh, what sparked this move from the f so-called formal sciences to the humanities and how has it come yeah. about? <laughs> yeah, well, hello everyone and uh, I'm really happy to be here uh, with you today. I started studies in mathematics, uh, computer science, uh, physics, chemistry. Uh, that was uh, what I wanted to do. My father did that, my uh, older sister did that, my older brother did that. I was running in the family and at the same time, um, I was raised in a Christian family, so my parents mm. uh, shared their belief with me, and I, I was a believer, as I still am. I was very interested in um, getting to know the Bible and um, very active in my parish. And um, at the same time, I had a number of questions about the Bible. And maybe this has happened to you also. If you open the Bible and you read it, there's a distance between the writers, the authors of the Bible in our world. And I wanted to understand that. And I was very frustrated not to find the answers. So I decided to, to change the course of my studies from uh, formal sciences to theology. And that was a very, uh, very difficult decision to make. I was already uh, quite ahead in my studies, uh, completing a bachelor's degree. I was majoring in uh, fundamental mathematics and doing a lot of uh, computer science as well. Um, and then uh, stopping that and starting all over again, uh, new studies in, in theology was, was difficult. My parents were a bit worried about me, saying, well, you know, what, what are you going to do? Do you have any idea for your future? I wasn't trying to have a, a career in academia. I thought, well, maybe I'm going to become a, a, a minister. I'm going to pastor a church or something. You know, that's usually what people do when they go and study uh, Protestant theology. Uh, the first semester was a nightmare. Uh, I was so much used to um, having formal proof or demonstrations. Uh, you know, in mathematics, if you have a theorem, you have a demonstration, it's knowledge. It's, you know it, it's not going to change. But when you move to uh, humanities, to philosophy, theology, history, it's all about, you know, hypotheses and theories and uh, 
to the state of our current knowledge, this is what we believe, you know, and uh, we think it's probably that had happened or this text should probably be understood that way. But the distance is so big, you know, the writers of the Bible, they, they speak another language, they lived in another time, in another place, another culture, everything is different. And so in the beginning, I thought I would never make it. I was like, okay, this was a mistake. Maybe I should go back to mathematics. <laughs> but I decided to persevere. And I had uh, great teachers also who encouraged me. But very quickly, what drew my attention was um, that I could use my skills, especially uh, this um, uh, uh, rational perspective on things and use it for the study of the Bible, maybe not in a philosophical perspective, but rather in a historical perspective. So I was more interested in history of religion, understanding the people who wrote the Bible, understanding their world, mm -hmm. studying their culture. What do we have? Can we do, uh, what can we know through archeology? span Do we have actual artifacts, something that I can, you know, touch, or maybe not, you know, don't touch, but I mean, <laughs> something that I can rely on to establish um, uh, theories as to the history of the Bible. So I was interested in that history and I ended up doing a PhD on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I have a picture here on the screen that I took. This is a, a site, uh, archeological site by the Dead Sea. And in that cave that you see uh, in the middle of the screen were found about 600 manuscripts and there are other caves in the neighborhood with other hundreds of manuscripts. In total, we have about a thousand uh, manuscripts, and these are the oldest manuscripts of the Bible. They, they are about 2,000 years old, and they are much older than any other Bibles uh, that we know of. So I thought, this is it. I need to study those manuscripts because they are the oldest textual witnesses of the Hebrew Bible. And um, they're not easy to study. Some of them are um, very well preserved. Here you have a very long scroll. Uh, if you unroll it, it's more than seven meters long, and it's one book in the Bible, it's the book of Isaiah. Uh, this is, of course, uh, the dream scroll where it's perfectly preserved, but most of them uh, are not um, as well preserved. This is a manuscript of the book of Psalms, and you can see it's fragmentary because it's old, it's, being, uh, it's, it's stayed in those caves for uh, centuries, millennia, and of course it has degraded. And so they are usually in not such a good condition. And I did my PhD on the book of Enoch, which is not even in the Bibles uh, in the Western world. It's uh, in the Bible in Ethiopia. The church, the Orthodox Church of Ethiopia, decided that the book of Enoch should be in the Bible, whereas other churches decided it should not. So I decided to study this manuscript, I mean this book, because the, some of the fragments uh, were found in those caves, in the Qumran Cave 4. And I also studied the book of Joshua, which is another book of the Bible. So this, this was basically my research, PhD and postdoc studies. Most of those fragments are very small. And I thought, um, I need to be able to reconstruct the text. And I thought I can use my computer skills to reconstruct the text. So this is, for instance, a series of small fragments. Each of those fragments has only two lines of text with only a few words. And the question is, how should we position them? We identify each one of them individually. We, I believe that they belong to the same area in the scroll, uh, but I'm not really sure how to position them. And I had this idea, and this was like, uh, well, more than 15 years ago, uh, I thought I can use computer software to do that, and I can even uh, reconstruct the script of the scribe, that is, imitate the script of the scribe to test my hypothesis. So for instance, this is one of the theories. So you can see this is only the fragments, and then I imitate the script of the scribe, and this is a digital uh, reconstruction of the text. Filling, filling the blanks. And I'm supposed to have nice columns, except that if you look at the third line from the top on the left-hand side, you see that the text goes too long in the margin. So I tested this hypothesis, it doesn't work. So I tried to position the fragments differently. I tested this hypothesis, but again, didn't work either. And then I tested a third one, a third positioning, and this one worked. 
And I was the first one to use that. And all of my colleagues and predecessors, they were used to you know, moving around the fragments. Some of them would maybe make photocopies and cut them and, I mean, do really. And one of my teachers was trying to copy by hand the, 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 to imitate the, the script of the scribe. No one had the idea that with computer science, uh, you could actually reproduce exactly the exact same handwriting. And so I did this about 15 years ago, and, uh, and uh, it was a major turn in our field. And I've, now I've been uh, uh, helping other people do that, and I've, I've been expanding this, uh, uh, this methodology to uh, study the, 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 the Bible, ancient Judaism, any other. I'm, I measured in uh, ancient inscriptions, I would say Hebrew, Aramaic, ancient Semitic inscriptions. So uh, I would say that now I'm really happy to see that I'm not the only one doing it. Uh, a lot of other colleagues are, are doing it. I'm really happy about it. And I'm really proud that I was basically the first one to uh, invent this, uh, this methodology, which now mm. would be called digital humanities, except at the time the term didn't exist. But now we would say, yes, that's <laughs> digital humanities. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it, from this example, we can really see how fruitful it was that you had that uh, the computer science background, natural science background. Has it also been sometimes difficult to fit in somehow, like if you have this kind of traje trajectory? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, um, depends. Well, I would say, uh, like, my, my PhD supervisor did not even have a computer, you know. He was old school. And I would say most people in, in France, in, in, in humanities, in Paris, in the Sorbonne, where I did my PhD, they're kind of old school. And so for him, I mean, it was a bit of a shock, you know, at first he did not see the benefits. And uh, I, I showed him the advantages of using computer science. Uh, I also uh, set up database, textual database. You know, when you have tiny fragments and you have only two or three words in a row, you're like, okay, where else did I see those three words? So mm -hmm. maybe you know the Bible by heart, maybe you don't. But the good thing is that now with like uh, search engines, basically you can just type in those words as well. This appears here and there and there. And I was able to solve a number of problems uh, because I designed a computer database. At the, t at the time, I even uh, created a website called semiticinscriptions.com. You know, it's a, it was the beginning of, of, the, of the internet, and everybody was really happy about that. But I was glad that my PhD supervisor, even though he was not used at all, he s immediately see the benefits, and he encouraged me. He actually uh, secured funding so that I could uh, keep working on that. But I must say that it was not everybody who was really happy about it. I had another professor, he was very reluctant. He was drawing everything by hand. He said computer science is, is, cannot do anything. I mean, he was, I think he was maybe frightened in a way that maybe computers would take his job. And that's yeah. always our fear. You're like, you know, maybe <laughs> someday, uh, like uh, two weeks ago I was in the Netherlands, we now have a project where we use artificial intelligence to do even more than that. The, the, the AI, we are training an artificial intelligence to now read the fragments itself, uh, figure out the, the positioning itself. And, uh, and so we're, we're joking, saying, you know, maybe 10, 20 years from now, you know, we'll, I mean, the, the machines will take over and we'll all be out of a job. And of course, so it's, uh, some people are reluctant to, to use those uh, new technologies. But um, I would say that the, uh, uh, I mean, those technologies will be developed with or without us. So I'd say it's better to do with, with us and, and to lead uh, the field. So uh, mm. it has not always been easy to combine the two. And um, I would say that especially 15 years ago, it was quite difficult. Uh, I would say that nowadays, uh, almost everybody agrees that it is useful that, that we need it. Uh, yeah. Not everybody knows how to use it. Uh, but, uh, but it's much better now. And it must, must also be an asset that somebody in the field, in the study of the Bible, is actually knowledgeable uh, in these computer uh, science uh, programs and all this programming. So yeah. I guess that's very, because otherwise th there would be a big gap. Uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Other people have tried to, to, mm. to um, set up that, those kinds of projects, especially bringing people from computer science, but they don't speak the same language. So like, mm. uh, you know, I want to do this and I'm trying to explain to this uh, computer analyst uh, and then he doesn't get it and, and the tools he, uh, he sets up are, uh, do not fit our needs. And so very often we lack people who are knowledgeable in both uh, fields. Mm. Yes, that's yeah. still quite unusual. Yeah, thanks, Michael. We'll come back to this as well. And now uh, I'd like to ask the third PowerPoint on 
and I'll introduce the third speaker, Emilia Mataix Ferrandis, who is also a core fellow at the Helsinki Collegium. And uh, she will tell about her career path. And she uh, used to be a practicing lawyer for a while, but she was also studying uh, Roman law. And then she just decided to focus on her PhD in Roman law and dedicate her time to that. But then she also en uh, ended up so she was writing a doctoral dissertation on the criminal liability of shipwrecking. And this drew her, uh, of, led her also to do a PhD in archaeology uh, so that she can uh, approach her topic from also from that point of view. So she will uh, tell her about that. So how, how did it come about that you, <laughs> you, you did these two PhDs and came to your research topic? Well, to be this, obviously, is because I'm a bit masochistic as well. <laughs> but um, uh, when Kaisa was talking, well, thank you very much for having me here, first of all. But secondly, it's um, with this slide that looks a bit tacky, I have to say. But uh, what I wanted to tell, essentially, is that deconstructing this idea of like when you are a lawyer and you are an archaeologist, they are kind of separate things. That, in fact, is problematic for me, because when they ask me what I am, I don't really know what to reply. I say, like, I'm in a mixture of a legal historian and an archaeologist. And here we have these two examples. But when Kaisa was talking about an organic path, I really feel that mine has been an organic path. Basically, um, I always wanted to study philosophy, but I was a bit coward, and basically there are lots of modern philosophers in Spain that work in IKEA, and I didn't want to be one of them. So I decided to study law, <laughs> to be more practical. But, you know, when you like humanities, at the end it comes to you. So I started discovering Roman law, and that was the most humanistic path you can take in law, so because it's a study of the role of the ancient Romans and that build the community, etc. So... Um, then, uh, when I started doing my PhD, uh, I went to Sicily, and I was so lucky that my supervisor there is one of, well, apart from me, that sounds very arrogant, but apart from me, he's kind of very rare examples of an archaeologist and a jurist. So, uh, because I was focusing on shipwrecks, I started diving with him and getting to understand the importance of not, not just rely on text, but also to look at the material evidence, because if not, you're not going to get the whole view. So that's why here I have well, this very big paragraph on my slide saying that basically when you study law, in fact you're studying society, because law is basically a set of rules that makes that people can live together and we don't really step on each other's path in a way. So to see the people behind the text and to see the people behind the materials, the only thing you can do is to mix both of things. So that's why in my first PhD, I start you know, like looking also in material evidence. And well, here I'm including this uh, picture of a Roman jurist, Gaius, that in fact, he was a teacher of Roman law in the province. And when we read his text, we realize that sometimes He's talking about stuff that when you look in the material evidence, it doesn't really make sense. Like even himself, as a lawyer, was being in this ivory tower, talking about legal constructions, but sometimes not being aware of what was going on in practice. So I'm trying to be even more than him and getting to know what was going on in antiquity, because as Michael is, is, has said, um, is when you study antiquity, the challenge is is, is enormous because you're talking about something that doesn't exist anymore. You need to learn other languages and interpret these languages the way they did. So for me, the best thing you can do is try to get a bird eye view by looking at the different evidence. And then is when you get, I get to these different fields. Like, uh, well, this must be practically the only picture you will see of me as an archaeologist because I'm very reluctant to take pictures of myself covered in dirt and sweaty, and it's what happens in an excavation. So here I have a beautiful picture of last field work or myself talking here in the Sapienza. So basically, uh, the problem when you do this kind of interdisciplinary path is that you don't fit anymore anywhere. You are kind of an alien in both houses. I have to say that the archaeologists are way more welcoming, and in fact, I feel like I fit there more, because they are like, oh, okay, we don't really know about text, so it's, we are happy that you're here to explain to us how these people act, because sometimes they just rely on material culture, and at the end, they don't see the agency this material culture has and the people interacting with it. With the lawyers, it's problematic, because they tend to be very dogmatic, so I'm kind of an stranger in my own path, in fact, now. And, uh, but what happened here is then I became even more interested, not just in how to mix these both disciplines to get to understand how Roman trade, that is my main field work, but also <laughs> in like, how can we communicate that? Because 
When I go to a conference in Roman law, people who study Roman law is communicating to people who study Roman law. So at the end of the discourse, stays in the same path. And archaeology is the same. You go to a conference on archaeology, and archaeologists talk to archaeologists. But because I'm a, I'm a mixed area, uh, sometimes I'm, I have to go to different fora where people come from different fields. And then I have to become way more interested in that, in outreach, and how can we communicate that to the people. Here, for example, I am including this uh, picture. This is one of the things I'm most proud I have done in the last years. And this one on the bottom that says citations. This is an art exhibition we had in my older university in Southampton. And I made it with colleagues from archaeology from different parts. And it was basically about how art can display archaeology and how can we communicate the importance of archaeology through different outreach ways. In fact, this guy that has, is making like a weird, it's a Japanese guy who studies Neolithic and he makes kind of mimic to represent that. But basically now I have become kind of a, a I don't know, like a lonely wolf in my past, trying to you know, go to different fora and trying to make understand, especially to people from law, that we need to get out of this ivory tower and we need to look at this material evidence. And so overall, because humanity is in such a, in a big crisis, I really think that intermingling the different and getting the, this knowledge uh, to work together, we are going to get a stronger position, in fact, and we are going to be able to communicate among us, because sometimes the problem is that we stay in our own path, and we don't communicate to each other, and then uh, sometimes people are like, oh, and I don't want to communicate with historians or with uh, epigraphists, because then they're going to step on my shoulders. But this is the only way, really, that we are going to really understand the past. If we just collaborate and we look at different, uh, at different uh, disciplines to get to understand the whole picture. Mm. So, well, basically that is what I wanted to say. I don't, I don't have that long path as Michael mm -hmm. and, uh, and Jane, so I don't really yeah. have... <laughs> but it sounds to me that you are doing important work as this kind of a bridge builder between these fields. It can be, of course, quite exhausting for you, but it's, it's well, you I, have to go to these two conferences or these kind of different uh, fields and, and talk to them and do the work of interpreting or like uh, translating between them. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, um, as I said, it was organic, I, yeah, I stepped that. I, uh, when, I, when I finished the PhD, I, I got offered this uh, position in a, for, to do a second PhD in this archaeological project. And uh, the problem is like, yeah, uh, everybody gets their mouth full of this word, interdisciplinarity. But then, as this space called uh, Sheet Academics say, we are always one bottle of wine away of real interdisciplinarity, okay? <laughs> because basically, everybody talks about interdisciplinarity, but then when you're interdisciplinar, is, is problematic. And even if I was in a project that was interdisciplinar, sometimes it was very difficult to communicate with my colleagues because obviously when you are doing this kind of interdisciplinary research, you become less of a specialist. And that is something that some people find scary because then everybody who is an expert, for example, I, I, I do Latin epigraphy, I study inscriptions, but I'm specialized in a, one concrete kind of epigraphy. But even then, because I do other stuff, I'm not the most specialist of that kind of thing. I have a general knowledge of that and a concrete knowledge on the inscriptions I've been working on. So if a real epigraphist comes to me, obviously he's going to know way more <laughs> about the field than me. But then I will have, probably because I study different things, uh, general knowledge to say, okay, but you have to put this in context, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, yeah, they think of translating. I think it's just, you get used to that when you're in the, talking to different people at the end. If you want to make yourself understood, you just need to, to build this kind of very down to earth. Mm -hmm. It's like when you are, and you know that as well as me, so when we are teaching, we are communicating sometimes things in a very using metaphors that sometimes we are like, okay, if I'm very strict in my discipline, you will not use that metaphor. Mm. But you need to do it for the students because the way they will understand that. Like sometimes to my students, I tell them that, oh, Roman law, okay, is the basis of our Spanish law. Yes, yes, okay. We need to think of different contexts. But I tell them to them, not because I'm a liar, it's because I think this makes more easier to them to build the schemes, you know? So it's kind of bridging the gap, trying to, not get too lost or hmm. to lose all the context. Do you, Jane and Michael, want to uh, comment on this, uh, what Emilia said about being a generalist or kind of this kind of interdisciplinary work? Well, I, I could say that I feel that the two disciplines that I trespass on a lot <laughs> in my work is our history and law. And I think when I first went into the archives with no knowledge of any kind of archival methods or techniques, um, I felt 
um, a bit anxious when I when I started talking to historians. But I mean, I have found them that they've been very, very generous and very interested. Um, obviously, some are much more strict in terms of you know what they think are proper methods and what a proper question is. But um, a number of them have been quite excited to hear how an anthropologist you know, sees archives and, and asks questions mm -hmm. about it. I have to say that I think the lawyers are a little bit more difficult oh. in, in <laughs> terms of um, opening up their ideas about how one might study legal processes. But having said that, I think anthropologists um, already have have done that quite a bit, but I do, I do also feel anxiety talking to <laughs> people who are specialists in law. Uh, but I think you just have to be have the confidence of your your question and and the thing you want to uh, you understand you, the thing you want to understand and find out about and yeah yeah which you have I think yeah yeah no in fact I mean when yeah. I decided to drop law to do this kind of thing you know at, obviously at the beginning well my parents were very supportive I was very lucky for that but my friends who are real lawyers and they are obviously earning more money than me now uh, <laughs> they were like oh, you're crazy it's very beautiful that you want to do that but you're crazy you know but now that I am traveling to so many places and stuff they are like Oh, so Roman law, right? <laughs> so you, you are in Finland now and you do Roman law. Okay, okay. So at the end, I think, you know, you, as, you, as you say, you need to follow your, and that comes to my last slide, truth will be mine. That is what, <laughs> what I'm trying to find, you know, like at least the closer to the truth. I'm obviously using that as well because this took place last week here. So I wanted to do like a wink to this. But yeah, and I think you, you need to just be honest with you, you know, you want to do that and try to follow your path. Like my ex-supervisor from Sicily, he has this very beautiful metaphor saying that you need to find the threat of Ariadne, referring mm -hmm. to the myth of Theseus. And in fact, it's true. And if you read the tale of Borges, that he reinterprets the myth of Theseus on the labyrinth, he just says that we are all in a labyrinth and we just need to find the threat that will take mm -hmm. it out, out of that. So when I was working as a, a maritime lawyer, I really hate my job, and in fact, Roma law has been the thing that has been making me happy. You know, like sometimes I have, yeah, you have, we have all these problems of like, oh, I need to find more funding and stuff. But at least I'm happy every day when I go to work. So, yeah, yeah. So uh, let us now talk uh, a bit about how this um, following your own path or finding that thread of Ariadne that Emilia <laughs> mentioned how this curiosity-driven research, what does it actually mean for the advancement of research or, or like scholarship? Uh, I remember one good example from Jane's earlier, one earlier event where, where you were talking about your book that you mentioned also today on dance, social dance in Greece, the first book mm. of yours, yeah. and how you worked on the concept of embodiment, which was not as widely used then as it is now, so that that maybe you can explain that because that was a good example of this yeah, kind of exactly. personal path and the path of the discipline. Yeah. <clears throat> so I knew that I knew already from my first trip to Greece as an undergraduate student that I that the body was very important um, in the kind of production and reproduction of gender. And when I got to grad school. I started in 79, and in around 1980, I read uh, a book by Pierre Bourdieu called The Outline of, Outline of a Theory of Practice. Um, and I, he, he, his discussion of uh, embodiment, uh, habitus, how we take, the world takes in a body, um, uh, in order for that body to create and express the world and that sort of dynamic between the world and the body. Um, I was very excited by that as a theoretical concept and in fact I called my my dissertation, my doctoral dissertation, Embodiments, the Social Construction of Gender in a Northern Greek Town. And when um, Princeton University Press, they wanted to publish it, uh, and they said, oh, but you can't call it embodiments. And I said, well, why not? And they said, because nobody will understand. Nobody knows this word. And I think, gosh, you know, this was, this was uh, in the, the late 
1980s. It was, the book was published in 1990 as Dance and the Body Politic in Northern Greece. I, I'm still pretty happy with the title, but had I been able to use the term embodiments, I'd be a lot more famous than I am now because it's really, it's really taken off uh, as, a, as, as a concept. So not one that I invented in any way, but I mean, it, it came to me via Pierre Bourdieu pr prior to that. Um, Merleau-Ponty, Marcel Mauss uh, in the kind of sociology, anthropology tradition. So it's really more through Bord via Bourdieu and Mauss that I, that I um, came upon the, the, the concept and then I developed it to look at, at dance. Um, and it's interesting that in anthropology it's, it's really been developed much more around medical anthropology. So that, that's where the embodiment discussion mm. kind of has, has mostly gone. Um, but yeah, so, so suddenly something uh, which is very unfamiliar, so unfamiliar that you can't possibly call a book by that title, you know, mm. has really become much more and important. something that was very a useful concept because you have noticed that it's such an important thing in your research material. Yeah, right? absolutely. Do you have some comments on this, like personal curiosity versus the development of the field or this kind of? Yes, well, you know, um, as I said earlier, um, I, I was able to switch from uh, hard science to um, history and to join the two, which is quite unusual and uh, which was not trendy at the time and has become trendy. I mm, said earlier, yeah. like, for instance, had I known, I would have called that like digital humanities yeah. because now digital humanities is very trendy. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think it's a good thing that, uh, that science develops. At the same time, um, the danger with trends is that everybody will rush into it without necessarily having enough um, um, uh, knowledge on the fields mm -hmm. and the methods. And I'm, for instance, I'm quite surprised now that we have chairs in digital humanities Whereas I think that digital humanities are tools and methods that we can use for our own fields. I work, for instance, uh, on antiquity and sciences of antiquity have different fields, different disciplines. And whether you do archaeology, epigraphy, history, you need digital tools, mm. I would say. So I wouldn't consider it a, a, as a science in itself. But it's still very interesting to have this interdisciplinary approach. And I would say that it's necessary and somehow um, it's a recent phenomenon that we have to talk about interdisciplinarity and to encourage it because we have to because a hundred years ago it was not necessary because the training, everybody was trained, I would say, mm. in what we would call today an interdisciplinary approach because mm. at the time a lot of those sciences did not exist in and of themselves. Uh, people would not say, I am a sociologist or I am an archaeologist because those sciences were only nascent. People were studying humanities, everybody was studying ancient languages, everybody was studying history. Mm -hmm. and, and now, of course, we are a hundred years later. And I would say since recent years, the thing is that there's so much documentation that everybody has to specialize in a very narrow field. And so I would say that's a recent phenomenon from the, uh, the second half of the 20th century, which results in the fact that some people would, will, will be very knowledgeable in a, in a very narrow field. And so if they stick to their narrow field, we lack this global perspective that we need. And that's very interesting to, uh, like uh, Emilia said, it's difficult to be a generalist. And at the same time, we desperately need those people now, people who have a broader perspective and who can talk to people on the field. For instance, if we're doing archeology span and someone will look at a pottery shard and say, but this, there's, a, there's a broader story. There's a, a whole culture. We need to do historical sociology, historical linguistics. We need, there are all those fields that we need to bring together in order to reconstruct what was going on uh, in those civilizations, for instance. Yeah. Yes, do you have a comment, Emilia? No, in fact, I think it's that, uh, or we have several specialists that they can work together with a general concept, and then each one can provide their speciality. That's why also these big projects that, that provide the specialists that work together in a field that can be mm. also useful. Yeah, and I especially, when you mention pottery, I especially think about that, because uh, I'm sorry if there are some pottery specialists in the, in the area, but really we need <laughs> to break a bit from just uh, measurements and quantification to really understand what is the human stories behind these pots. Mm. And, you know, I've been in these uh, conferences about material culture and pottery, and there were huge discussions about calling a pot something 
because it was two millimeters shorter than the other, and really arguing and shouting to each other. And I was like, really, but you're talking about measurements. You're not talking about the people doing that. So I was the, that's when I understood, this is useless. That's why you need a, a generalist here to mm. break the point on this kind mm. of just systematic and dogmatic research. Yeah, um, maybe we could, uh, at the end, uh, talk about the conditions of doing this kind of work where you are kind of you are led as a researcher by your curiosity and you're like these kind of questions that emerge in the research process so as as you know a lot of research funding uh, these days is more like agenda driven or there's a mo some sort of preset agenda uh, set by even theme uh, set by some funding body um, whereas what we we have been um, talking about here is more of this kind of research led by, by the researchers themselves or their interest. Um, so if you think of, first, if you think of the research context you, have been, context you have been involved in, what in specific has kind of enabled this kind of work, this kind of organic path that you have had? And do you see, like, do you see that this is possible in current, like contemporary academia, or is it, in somehow, is it somehow in danger, this kind of freedom? Who wants to start? <laughs> <laughs> Ranting. Yeah, well, I, I, I must say that things have changed, at least in France, from my perspective, that uh, research labs used to have funding, um, basic funding, without asking for money specifically. Every year, uh, when I was a PhD student, mm -hmm. we would have funding. So we, we really had this freedom to say, well, I am curious. We talk about curiosity. I'd like to explore this aspect. And I could just do it. I don't have to justify. I don't have to prove. I mean, I have this funding I can use. And then the French government decided to stop that. So research teams do not have basic funding. It's only you have to have a project, and then you have to apply, and then it's peer reviewed, and maybe you get the funding. Except that if you think outside the box, especially if you have an interdisciplinary approach, then who, are go who is going to evaluate your project? Uh, people who are going to read it, maybe someone from one field, someone from another field, and everybody will think that this is not going enough in their direction. And so it's a, it's a big mess. So I, from what I can see now, uh, more and more I apply to international funding, especially, uh, well, you see here in, in here, Helsinki, for instance, and other places where there's a, 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 an openness to the idea of going beyond the boundaries of traditional disciplines uh, to do frontier research and say, well, you have the curiosity. We think that you have the, a good background. We can see that you've been doing good research so far. We trust that you will be doing a good job, so we give you money. But it's, it's, it's difficult, and I would say it's getting more and more difficult. Like ERC, uh, the European Research Council, is also funding interdisciplinary research, but, that, but at the same time, they say you, we need to do frontier research. It has to be high risk, but it has to be high gain. And so it, it's, it's this kind of a double entendre. You know, like you, well, you have to say you're, you're going to do something that n nobody has ever done before. You have to go where man has never set foot. You know, explore the boundaries mm -hmm. of space. Uh, but at the same time, you need to tell what you're going to find. Well, if I'm going to explore uncharted territory, <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to find. And actually, I don't know if I'm going to find anything. But I think that's the most beautiful thing in research. And uh, I'm afraid it's, it's more and more difficult to secure now, uh, unfortunately. So uh, I'm glad that there are some places where this is uh, encouraged. And uh, I've been uh, lucky to be selected as a, a jury in France to select projects like this. you know. And I've, I've made sure that when I select a panel uh, of, of uh, peer reviewers to, to select people who also have an openness and who are willing to go beyond uh, the scope of their own research. So what places would they be in France where this kind of fundamental That's called the is? University Institute of France. And every okay. year, um, 110 uh, university professors are selected from all fields for five years. And they are relieved of teaching. Well, they teach a little bit, just like a couple of hours a week. The rest of the time is research. And that's a great thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted to pull the thread to another discourse, uh, discourse related to this, like you say, agenda uh, driven, like mm -hmm. uh, agenda driven research. I will also pull the thread on uh, corridor driven agenda, mm -hmm. talking about the endogamia of the endogamy of the of the academia, because okay, this is not the case here. I'm not talking here is a wonderful place, but in other places like my own country, for example, sometimes you cannot even apply for your well, you can apply for your research funding, but it's like you know that the person who is staying there and not getting international international internationalized. 
and living abroad and even, you know, having to suffer more because I need to adapt to a new place, to a new context of research, etc. but getting new inspiration and feedback and ideas, sometimes it's going to be punished for that because they are going to give the award or the money to the person who has been in the department for longer, you know, so... It's a bit of a ranting, sorry, but <laughs> it's kind of warning for this situation because it happens in, in different countries and it's problematic because they, then it's like, oh, we want you to go outside because we want you to be internationalized, we want you to get networking, we want to get your feedback, but if you go, you will never go back or it will be very difficult for you to go back. So it's, it's also problematic in research because on the one hand, if you got outside, yeah, sometimes it's difficult to go back and then you need to move from country to country. So then you are kind of like adapting to new schemes of research every two or three years. Yeah. So uh, it is a very interesting topic because there are so many, there are a lot of academic nomads who have been yeah. in different mm. contexts. And of course, that's as we hear in your trajectories, that's probably a huge gain for research because they draw on different contexts and different dis dif discussions. But it can also be personally very draining, right? Absolutely. As, as you referred. Um, mm. yeah. Yeah. So about so, Jane, about so Britain, maybe you could tell yeah. us a bit more. So there, there's been, there have been some pretty profound changes, I think, in Britain. Mm. Um, so I started working at University of Sussex in 1991. And at that time, I mean, first of all, uh, research was considered to be 40% of our jobs. I think it still is, but... We, we used to be able to more or less count on getting one term out of nine, it's not very much, but at least uh, sort of three to four months uh, every three years to do our research. And then gradually that kind of disappeared as uh, a right and it became, you know, something that would be decided on by a committee if your project was good enough. Uh, but more and more we were expected to bring in outside money. Um, and, and it you know, it very much depends on not only how good your project is, but how sexy your project is, mm. how, how it, you know, how well it appeals to the particular, you know, fashions of the day, of the funding bodies, on whether you get funded uh, or not. Uh, so, you know, some people were getting a lot of funding and other people weren't. Um, and I think that it, it is true that within academic departments and schools and institutions, you can, you can help each other and kind of cross-subsidize a little bit and recognize the, the inequalities uh, of funding. And, and I, I, I have to say that I think at Sussex we, we have tried to do that. But, you know, this sort of er erosion of the expectation that, that we will all do research and that will be respected and, and supported, you know, that's kind of um, disappearing a, a bit. Uh, I think also the, there, there are certain kind of learned societies and funding bodies who... Um, promoted both kind of quirky and interdisciplinary work like the British Academy. I've been lucky enough to get, you know, funded I think twice, maybe even three times by the British Academy, which is a very different sort of approach to looking at research than my experience of the um, ESRC, the Economic and Social Research Council, which tends to be dominated by the hard, uh, let's say, positivist so sociologists and social, social scientists, not like the softies, uh, the kind of interpretivists like, like anthropologists like me. Um, and you get exactly that problem that you're talking about, Michael, where, where you get uh, an interdisciplinary group of reviewers and somebody takes against, you know, your particular methodological approach and really tries to, you know, mark you down and, and, and then you, you don't get it. So you run into these kinds of problems. Um, I mean, I wanted to say one thing also because I'm, I'm more senior than the other, my other two colleagues here, that I have a lot of experience, you know, sitting on funding councils and scientific committees and so forth, many of which are interdisciplinary. And I think that that's a place that we can and we should, you know, exercise that generosity of, of, of spirit and, and intellectual, yeah. 
uh, generosity to really welcome, you know, interdisciplinary and kind of innovative kinds of work which cross those boundaries, which, you know, do something new um, and not just be kind of um, seeking to benefit our own particular discipline. So I think that's, mm. that's one thing that we can do to keep this kind of curiosity-driven research, you know, alive. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, is there also a possibility for researchers to somehow use the discourse of the agenda-driven uh, 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 kind of funding bodies to get money for their fundamental research? I think Michael had a good example of this one project on uh, some ancient, some, some manuscripts. Can you tell us? Yes, yes. Well, you know, that's the thing, you know, when you have this call for applications for grants, usually, you know, they, they want specific things, you know, and uh, that's the game, you know. So either you play by the rules or, you know, you, you don't play the game. But uh, this colleague of mine told me he really wanted to study this whole corpus of ancient manuscripts of the Bible in Aramaic, Aramaic versions mm -hmm. of the Bible. We call them Targums. And there are hundreds of those manuscripts in libraries throughout Europe. They've been sitting there for centuries. Nobody has studied them. So we, we don't know what they say. And they are important witnesses for the history of the Bible. So he applied to the ERC for a consolidator grant uh, last year. And, um, and they rejected his proposal saying, well, basically he has no new methodology. Like he's going to, what, to study those manuscripts, like old school people looking at it, you know, transcribing, editing, translating, annotating. You know, we've been doing that. You know, there's nothing new there. So they rejected his proposal. And then so he thought about it. He said, I really need the money because this really needs to be done. So he said, if they want a new methodology, I'll come up with one. So he asked a colleague of his, uh, someone he knew from the natural sciences, from biology, to say, well, you know, in, in DNA research, you like, you know, you compare DNA and see what's common, what's different to have this tree, this family tree. And I'd like to do the same thing with those manuscripts. That is, you know, a family tree of the, which manuscript was copied from which manuscript and when did they split this variant reading was introduced there. You know, and and so they came up with this new proposal. It was basically the same project, except with this small flavor, saying I'm going to work with someone in biology. And he got the project, he got the funding. But he told me really that the interesting part in the project is really that we have those manuscripts that need to be edited. Mm -hmm. So yes, in, in, I would say if you want to secure funding, you need to know what they are expecting and you probably need to somehow speak their language and find a way that will be interesting for them, you know, and will mm -hmm. still accommodate what, uh, what, what's your per personal uh, mm -hmm. goal in, in, your, in your research. So, Emilia, do young scholars think a lot about that these days? Like, you are a postdoctoral scholar, so you also have to think about securing funding for the future yeah. and position. So, do you think about this a lot? About how uh, to frame your research in a different way because of the funding? Yeah, well, in the base, I'm a lawyer, so I'm used to normally <laughs> phrase my things to make it attractive and convince people about that. Yeah, no, no, in fact, yes, yeah, it is like, a, like, for example, when I present my project here. Um, I then later when I came here, I met casually one of the law professors who had evaluated my proposal, and and I, his, and I said, and he said, oh yeah, your title was very weird. What do you actually mean with that title? And I was like, okay, but thank you very much for approving my proposal. You don't understand it, but he told me it was very attractive because it was materializing and tracing Roman C trade law. But he told me, what did you mean by materializing? It, it appealed to me because it was beautiful, but I don't know what you mean. So yeah, no, you. I don't know, I think it's this mixture between making it think new and, uh, I don't know, yeah, telling them what they, what they want to hear, you know, in some, in some ways. And, uh, but at the end, being a bit, as Michael was saying, we sometimes apply for things and we know that maybe we are saying that we're going to do too much, that, I mean, even if we had like double the time and double the funding, maybe we will not get to do that, but they really want you to, to put lots of tasks, you know, like I'm going to do that and I'm going to, you know, like, like make this, this circle a square or something like that, you know, so, but mm. you, you need to do that in order to get funding. Yeah, we were before this discussion, we were talking a lot about how it's very difficult because the temporality of research is very different from the temporality of uh, like funding policies or research policies, so you have to somehow because uh, if um, you have this kind of fundamental research project, uh, you might get the result uh, much later, or you could get kind of um, 
you, somebody invests money and you get a return maybe in the next historical period <laughs> even. So, so this, there's this kind of a fundamental mismatch between the temporalities somehow. There is, but <coughs> I think that funding agencies should be thinking about the long-term trajectory of the scholar you know, that yeah. they're supporting yeah. as well. Um, I wanted to say that uh, I, I went back and looked at the proposal that I wrote to MacArthur back in, I wrote it in 1996, a long time ago, and I, uh, which, which was to, to, to get some money to go and work in the League of Nations archives, and I called it the past and future of living with diversity, rather grandiose title, but, yeah. but uh, what I was trying to say was that maybe we can learn something about contemporary issues of living with di diversity by looking at you know, how uh, this was being kind of dealt with in this transition from empire to nation states right mm -hmm. after the First World War. And so what, what I said I was going to do was really get into this multicultural kind of debate because that's what was emerging in the late 90s, early 2000s. And, you know, I, so I spent a lot of time reading that. Now, I, I promised to do something in the proposal that was way more than I could do in a year. Um, I, I don't think I realized that at the time, but, but, but it's still been um, something that, you know, I, I sort of developed a foundation and the, the questions that kind of I, I worked on over the next 20 years, you know, were, were linked to those, mm -hmm. those discussions and debates that I was reading and thinking about. So mm -hmm. I don't think that... Um, I mean, hopefully, we, we might have to attract funders by making it sound very relevant to the particular moment, but hopefully um, the scholar doesn't need to be constrained by that, mm. and hopefully also funding agencies realize that they're, they're funding scholars for short amounts of time, but, but who have a longer trajectory themselves. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Besides yeah. that, I wanted to say, and also it's one of the beautiful things of research, that it's not just what you propose, it's also that when you're researching, obviously new questions appear, and then you start like, you know, like for me, research is like a ball of snow, like rolling and rolling and picking things on the way, and then yeah. at the end you're like, oh my God, now I have so much on my, yeah. on my plate, I, I think I'm going to do now so but it's beautiful because then well then you need to apply for a new project and then you will have more questions and it's kind mm. of a never-ending story probably yeah. but mm. yeah that's the that's the beauty of research and uh, when it's driven by curiosity of course you 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 explore an area because mm. you have questions and then when you get there you have answers but you have new questions and you jump mm. from one thing to the next and from the outside it may look as if we're doing different things like some people mm -hmm. have told me but you know how come you are both interested in the medieval manuscripts in Ethiopia and old inscriptions from a thousand years before Christ I mean this this doesn't seem to there, there's no mm. cohesion actually there is mm -hmm. and I can explain it through my research path saying well mm. you know I study this and then this led to this and this and I think this is the, the beauty of fundamental research or frontier mm. research is that yeah. you, you, the trajectory is not linear because you don't know ahead of time of course yeah. where you will go and when it comes to funding of course the it's is uh, I mean funding is always uh, constraint in time so the idea is both to know that you know the path the, on the, the long period of the path will will move will take you from one place to another and at the same time to be able to decompose it into stages and say, so, well you know mm -hmm. I can focus on that for the next two three five years and then from there we'll see what we will do of course that there's a dis there's a difference with the publications for instance if I do research now uh, probably my research will be published in a few years, uh, especially if it's fundamental or frontier research. So, um, of course, the, 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 the publications will come later, but you can still acknowledge that this research was funded by, you know, this or this and, yeah. uh, and, and keep on. And then on the basis of what you have done, then you can ask for more funding and say, now I have another project uh, for the next five years and hopefully you can get more funding. Yeah. I think uh, our time, time is up now, but we still have some time for questions from the audience. So there, I, th I believe there is a mic at the back, which will come to you if you have a question. Yeah, we have one there. Hi. Hello. So I apologize. I'm going to read off my phone because I'm asking a question on behalf of a colleague who's watching from Romania. Okay. So somebody's watching the live stream. Um, and it has to do with being a PhD student. And what about those changes in our paths when we encounter unexpected things in the field? 
Like when we're out in the field, is it fair enough to defend changes in our research by saying that's how things unfolded in the field? What's the answer? Um, well, I could say that many, many anthropologists in my experience, both colleagues, students, uh, people I've read about, have changed their whole project uh, in the field, either because the project they initially wanted to do turned out to be impossible, you know, uninteresting, um, or something else, something else was going on, something completely different was going on that, that really required uh, attention or the, the, the researcher wanted to kind of look into it. So um, it, it, it didn't happen in my case. I mean, I, I, I did kind of have a fairly clear idea of what I wanted to do, although one always finds unexpected things in the field. But uh, it certainly isn't un unusual. And I mean, I just uh, actually examined, uh, I, I've examined two doctoral theses in the last month, and the first one was one like that, uh, of a young man who wanted to go uh, look at um, the way that, let's say, environmental tracking of deforestation was being used by an indigenous group in Peru. And uh, a short time into his um, preparations for, for research, um, he was badly beat up in a, in a kind of, you know, car jacking and um, decided he was just too afraid to, to kind of deal with that particular topic. And he was also having a lot of doubts about, you know, me, a British white guy, what am I doing going in and doing this kind of research? So he, he was having a lot of political reservations and he ended up kind of transforming his research. Now, he was able to pull it off because... Um, he could, f you know, formulate a new, a new project and he was being supported very well by his two supervisors. Um, so I think it, it, it does depend on, you know, the, the kind of supervision you're getting, the, the context of your discipline, um, whether you have that kind of flexibility. But it's certainly in my field is something that is, is actually rather common. Mm. I've seen that with many colleagues archaeologists that were forced to change their research. Basically, they were based on areas that are in war. So, for example, one colleague that was working in Kurdistan, he was on a dig. Um, basically, the army have to took them away because was like, you're going to die. And he was like, no, but I want to study this. Yeah, but you're going to die. Okay, so yeah, yeah. let's go away. So he needed to change that. But this is okay. You are forced to change it and everybody's going to understand and they're going to help you. The other thing is like when you're starting with one topic and suddenly you realize that the sources are not telling anything new or there's nothing to dig on that. And then it's when you need to be very honest and say, okay, I need to change because this is not going to take me to any way new. And at the end, the PhD needs to be some research that is original. So I think it's this mixture of like when you're forced or when you just, you know, let the sources speak and tell, you know, like, like and maybe there's, as Michael was saying, sometimes you are not going to find anything. So you need to be honest that sometimes there's nothing to take and then you need to change your path. Yeah, I had, um, when I was doing my PhD, I had a friend who was also doing a PhD at the same time, and the very topic of her PhD, she was studying the god Reshef, he's a Phoenician god, that is, a Phoenician is Lebanon, you would say, modern day Lebanon, but like 3,000 years ago. And she wanted to gather all the sources, you know, in archaeology and literature to study the, his god and the beliefs in his god. And then, right before she finished her PhD, there was this very famous scholar, um, in, uh, in Belgium, who published this huge book on, entitled like The God Rechef, like, like everything <laughs> you need to know. And it was exactly her topic, and it was devastating for her because basically mm -hmm. he was a, a senior scholar mastering the field, saying all there is to say, and, and she was left without uh, any, uh, any possibility to add anything new to contribute to the field as a, as a PhD student. And it's very dangerous. If you, if you maintain this course, then, then uh, maybe you, know, you can have a nice supervisor who will say, well, we'll, we'll still give you your, your degree 
degree, you'll get a PhD, but afterwards to, uh, uh, to pursue a career, people will say, well, but what is your contribution to the field? I would say it's wiser to change course, to change another topic, even though it's a bit painful, but say, well, I really need to show that I can contribute something to research. So I think it's better and it's, it, you don't have to be ashamed of changing the course of your research because the, the, prim the, the primary purpose is to contribute to, to the field of science. Mm. Okay, thanks. Uh, are there further questions? From the audience. Yes, there's one over here. Thank you very much for sharing your research path. I would like to ask you, are you now anticipating a next turn? What will happen with you next? Change of field? Change of something? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question, thanks. Okay. Who wants to start? Amelia? Uh, no, I think I don't want to change my field. I mean, I'm, I'm <laughs> in, in between two lands now. If I go to a third one, I think I'm going to go crazy. But I don't know. I think you always get interested in other paths because when you have just tried to be in between things, you start, you know, and also here in Helsinki, like, for example, I have colleagues working like, like, as, yeah, like anthropologists or geographers, and they are, you know, picking my brains about new methodologies. So basically, I don't think... I will change personally, but I'm more open to accept new methodologies to my research as well. So, yeah, well, I'd say I, I I don't know what the future holds. I'm interested in so many different things. Um, I could easily change. I would say now I must say that I'm really interested in uh, antiquity as a whole and and um, and uh, the engineers. So it is. So, but it's 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 a huge area. Um, uh, focusing on archaeological excavations, for instance, or on the contrary, on literary sources. Uh, I have this new project now studying forgeries because I was, uh, again, it's, it's uh, by chance I was faced with uh, modern counterfeits and, uh, and I was like, now who does that? In like, like making fake manuscripts and I realized that this has been going on since antiquity. So now I'm again driven by curiosity. I'm, I'm now changing a little bit and say, well, maybe for the next five or 10 years, I'll study the history of literary forgeries since antiquity today related to the Bible, for instance. So that's, you see that, mm. I, I think it's, uh, I'm open and I would say that with the proper um, background and, and, and enthusiasm and curiosity, you can really, really easily go from one field to the next uh, very smoothly mm. and happily. Mm. Yeah. Um, I have two books kind of on the go, and I think until I finish them, <laughs> I'm not sure where the next turn is going to be. Um, I mean, it, it could be something very different. I mean, I love film and, and literature, mm -hmm. and, and who knows, I might kind of move, move into that area somehow. But I think at the moment, the two projects that I've got are going to always throw up new, new questions and issues, so I'm sure from within them, mm -hmm. very likely, my next term will come from them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what I'm interested in, on, like, for example, that doesn't mean that they will get to another field is, as I was said, I am very interested in like, how you show to people with different languages, especially in a very graphic language, what you do. And then I become like a, well, I'm, I'm a big fan of comic books um, since mm. many years ago. Mm -hmm. But recently, because of this exhibition, I told you, I get in contact with lots of uh, graphic novel artists that are archaeologists as well, and they mm. use comic books to tell to people, you know, different things of like from endangered cultural heritage, from one lady that I love, Hannah Sackett, that she does ontology of objects, so she, she uh, draw these beautiful comic books about objects and stuff. And I'm always in contact with them, and this is something that, I mean, I, I, I'm really bad at drawing, but it's something that I would like to have, you know, like a workshop or something like that on comic books and archaeology. That is a field in itself, you know, and it's really, really interesting how you can, uh, for example, in that workshop we had, we had like a list of objects that you have to draw. And it was incredible to see how people perceive this phenomena very differently and they describe it very differently on, on graph graphically, you know. So we get to, okay, so what you have to understand as archaeology is this. Mm, it's interesting, but okay, let's see about the other person. And I'm very, uh, I will maybe go to that point at, if I have the time at some point. Mm, really that sounds really great. I think you should do that, definitely. <laughs> And yeah. I think our time is going to end. If there is a short question, you can still pose it, or then you can also come to talk to 
uh, us here after this event. But thank you so much. And I actually want to mention that there's a second part of the series of this spring's Collegium Talks uh, discussions that will be uh, on Wednesday, April 3rd, also at 4 p.m. here at Think on a Stage. And then uh, we have as a title, Curiosity-Driven Research in Practice. And there will be four, uh, four scholars plus a moderator talking about different fields like literary, um, literary studies, anthropology, linguistics, and archaeology, at least. So, and, and, and also social sciences and science and technology studies. So that's, that'll be a very interesting um, discussion as well. Uh, and we will post about them on our Twitter page uh, at H Collegium and also on Facebook uh, at Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies. So thank you for coming today. And, and thank you for all our thank wonderful you. speakers as well. <clears throat> thank you, Kaisa, for organizing all yep. this.